I think the silence was my cue. Then. Welcome, welcome to our morning service, our early service. Uh, wherever you're joining us, you might be um, at home, you might be here in the building, uh, you might be, as I'm seeing on the live chat, further afield than you usually are. You're very, very welcome uh, to our service this morning. And welcome to Pentecost Sunday. Whoop there. If you'd like to greet each other in a familiar style, if you want to whoop, that's fine. But it's Pentecost, it's a really exciting day. Happy Pentecost. So we're celebrating the birthday of the church over 2,000 years ago as the promised Holy Spirit comes in power on the disciples gathered in Jerusalem and gathered in prayer. So from Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. The Holy Spirit coming into places and into people, filling places and people with his presence and his power. So as we gather this morning, wherever we are, let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you love to give your Holy Spirit to your children. On this special day, we invite you to come, Spirit of the living God, come into our homes, into our churches, into us, and fill us, fill me in new and powerful ways. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done in me, in us today. Amen. So let's sing of God's grace and his pouring out of himself and his love through the Holy Spirit as we gather this morning. And we're going to sing a Holy Spirit living breath of God and all heaven declares as we join him with heavenly worship this morning. So if you want to stand, I think you're very welcome to. If you want to sit, that's okay too. But uh, worship and join in as you are able and led by his Spirit.
him with the angels as we declare and proclaim your praise. And on this Pentecost, come Holy Spirit and fill us with new songs of worship and thanksgiving. Amen. Please uh, do sit down if you're in the building. I would imagine that you're sitting down at home, although I know a number of you do stand up for the songs even at, um, at home. As we think of the gift of the Holy Spirit, we think of him coming in power. And we think of him coming and refining and cleansing us. And sometimes we don't have the words to express what we feel about God, what we feel about the, the world, and the Holy Spirit promises to come and join with us and help us to pray. He's going to lead us now in our confession, which is where we say sorry, those places where we haven't declared the praises of God, where perhaps we haven't trusted God's power for the circumstances we're in. So we'll just have some silence, and then the words will appear, and then we'll say the confession, the words of sorry together. Lord Jesus invites us to come as we are. So we say together, Most merciful. <laughs> we have put against you. We have slandered you in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sins. Renew the right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So hear the hope of God that gives us the power to live differently in the love of Jesus and his spirit. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. As forgiven people, we join together with people throughout the world, our Christian brothers and sisters in whichever communities they're worshipping today and saying things that are similar about what we believe. So we're going to say the words of our creed. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received, and this we believe. Amen. Now, Malcolm, I think you're going to come and lead us in the Not to 18s focus. Oh, sorry. This about lost my mic then. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that's a bit more like. Um, it's lovely to be here, isn't it? And it's a uh, beautiful su- oh, no, that's next weekend, isn't it? <laughs> next weekend, the beautiful sunny morning is 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 in the is in the eye now. We can see that Bank Holiday weekend is going to be spectacularly fantastic for weather. Uh, it's a big sporting weekend, though, isn't it? Um, and uh, you know, it's the whole wrapping up of the whole Premiership today. Everybody's excited about that. All you Liverpool supporters are excited, aren't you? Yes. Can't wait. You're in pole position. You can't make a mistake today, though. And of course, all you Tramia sports getting excited because you're just two one down. It's not that bad, is it? And you might possibly make it to the playoff final, another trip to Wembley to play again in League Two. <laughs> but um, let's see. I'm hoping for that because all of you know I'm a Carlisle United supporter, and I love my trip down to Brentford Park once a year to watch my team get beat, um, which is what generally happens. And I bring up sporting because actually we're in a marathon. At the moment, aren't we? We are in the in the zero to eighteen crowd. We're in a marathon race as we try and work our way through the fruit of the spirit, and uh, we've actually reached thirteen point one miles now. We're halfway. We've done love. We've done joy. We've done peace. And that other one I don't like talking about. What's it called? Patience. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. We've done patience, and we come to the the middle of the. Of the, of the flavors of this fruit, this singular fruit that God gives to us. And that is the word kindness. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness. And uh, uh, it's sort of wishy-washy word. When people used to say, people used to say, well, I wouldn't, Malcolm's a lovely boy, he's kind. He never really, he never really cussed it, did he? Or, uh, 
it wasn't one of those words that you wanted to be called. Um, when I was growing up, anyway, people used to say, Malcolm, you've got, you've got a kind face. And then they used to follow it with the kind that makes me want to throw up. Um, but that's, that's just the way it was. But we reach kindness now, right in the middle. And kindness is a word which is rooted in humility. Its roots are in humility. You know, when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with everything that you've got, and love your neighbor as yourself, put other people first. Kindness is rooted in that. That's what it's about. It's being kind, it's being humble to think that the other person is more important, bigging up somebody else and not bigging yourself up. And 240 times in the Old Testament, God is called kind. He's a kind, kind God. We know that, don't we? We know that his love for us comes way before we love him. There is no conditions to that kindness that God shows while we were still sinners. God sent his son Jesus to die for us. We know that. But we're to live knowing that kindness in our own hearts. And in the 0 to 18 groups, they're looking at a story. And uh, for those of you who don't know why we have a focus here, it's because there are some young people at home watching. And they, they, uh, they're our Pathfinder group and our Explorer group this morning because they're not meeting on it. We've got seed and grow and jam down there. And they're looking at a story of immense kindness in the Old Testament. The story of Ruth, the Moabite, who... Um, whose mother-in-law, Naomi, was left with no, no husband and no children and wanted to move home. Ruth, who gave up everything, who showed great kindness to her mother-in-law to travel with her back to a country where she knew nobody. A story of heartache, a story of homelessness, really, rooted in kindness. As Ruth moves back to the country with Naomi, she finds herself, what, gathering the wheat around the corner of the field, which was directed to, to for people who were homeless, people who had nothing. There was, a, there was a, an Old Testament rule. You left some left some, some, some food around the corners of the field, and she, she finds her way onto a field, and she's gathering uh, gathering the corn. And who does she meet? She meets somebody who shows her great kindness, Boaz. They eventually get married, and that's the story that they're looking at uh, in, in their time. Down there. But I just want to bring up another story which I think shows kindness because if you follow that family line down, the children, the children, the children, the children, who do we come to? We come to our rescuer, don't we? We come to Jesus who shows God's kindness perfectly. He shows God's kindness perfectly. He's on his way to Jerusalem. His head is full of all sorts of things. He knows why he's going to do that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He knows that he's going to his death. And as he goes on that journey, the crowds of people are all around him and they're shouting, yes, here he comes, here comes Jesus. And the followers are already puffed up thinking, here he is, here he is, we're going to go through into Jerusalem and we're going to see something amazing happen. And somebody shouts up. A man who'd been born blind shouts up and says, Jesus, Jesus, I'm here. Everybody else says, shush, don't disturb him now. Jesus isn't just nice here, is he? He doesn't just say hi to the guy as he walks past. He doesn't just um, just give him a, a wave or a nod, a knowing nod. He just stops and says, bring him to me. And then he miraculously heals Bartimaeus. See, kindness isn't just a feeling, is it? It's an action. And I don't know if you've ever thought to yourselves, am I showing the fruit of the Spirit in my life? Well, here's a good point to start off. Stop now. Have a think about whether you're being kind. Whether you're being kind to people. Whether you're being kind to them because you want them to be kind to you. Or whether you're taking Jesus' example and being kind. If it is that you're being kind to people because you want some kindness back, then I would suggest that that isn't the kindness that the fruit of the Spirit brings. And now would be a good time for all of us, really, to actually just stop and maybe 
if we're feeling like we're not showing of kindness. You see, you only know it's an apple tree, don't you, when it's growing up. But some of you might maybe know it by its leaf. But I only know an apple tree by what it produces, what the fruit it produces. If it produces an apple, I know it's an apple tree. If we're producing fruit, kindness, we know that we're with God. And um, so stop, have a little think. Are you being kind? If you're not, you know, it's not something that you, here's the miraculous thing. You don't have to try and be more kind. It's not some sort of personal thing, a self-help thing. I'm going to try to, as from tomorrow, I'm going to try and be more kind. Actually, what's happened, what you need to do is stop and spend more time with God. And when you spend more time with God, you become more like and you show the fruit, the singular fruit, with the nine characteristics of the spirits of love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. So I'm going to suggest that that's uh, what we do now. We're going to pray, and I'm going to uh, lead us in a little prayer for those of you at home. I hope uh, you look at that story of uh, Bartimaeus in the Bible as well as the one about Ruth and, uh, and Naomi and Boaz. Let's just pray. Loving Heavenly Father, help us to know you more. Help us to show you in our lives through absolute scandalous kindness shown to those around us. Lord, as it doesn't have a story, as Bartimaeus gets up, being able to see, and he follows Jesus, help us to do that in the way we are with those around us. And Father, we pray that people might see your kindness and follow you. Amen. Thank you. In Pentecost, we've been thinking uh, about generosity. Um, thank you to everyone who's uh, responded so generously and faithfully uh, to our gift day uh, last week and through this week. Uh, there's still time to uh, fill in response forms here in person. You've got one on your uh, seat. Or go to the website. Um, there are a number of us joining online. Uh, so go to the website and make your response. Uh, today, we're thinking in particular about time and gifts and talents. And in the season of generosity, there is much that we can be involved with uh, in giving ourselves away here and being kind uh, to each other and serving God in the purposes that he has for us. If you've got a, a copy of the Church Family News, and I encourage you to have that to hand, um, you'll see all the things that are going on. And um, as we go through this time, uh, we are looking uh, to increase carefully and steadily and the range of activity that we can have, the ways that people can get involved. Um, we're looking at our services all the time, and we're encouraging welcome and hospitality. And today there is tea and coffee in person here. Yeah, a bit weak, guys. I think we can do that again. There is tea and coffee in person here. If you're not so sort of fussed about the tea and coffee, fine, but there is an opportunity really to be together for a little bit longer here, and also an opportunity uh, to be blessed by a fantastic team of volunteers. It doesn't happen without them. So uh, be encouraged in that. It might be something that you think, actually, I could give a little bit of time to that. Um, I'll give some instructions at the end about how we're going to do that here. Um, we're thinking about the shape of church services, and we do that all the time. Um, it's an uncertain time, and we have to plan carefully for a whole range of circumstances. Um, I said at the annual meeting that it's always good to hear from people as we go forward together about what the a healthy pattern of, of worship might look like on Sunday and midweek. Uh, and if you want to uh, talk to me and Alec um, as we sort of balance up all the things that have to happen, um, please do so. Um, as we go forward into the future. A number of you have already done that. 
uh, keep bringing your thoughts and particularly your prayers as we discern the way forward in terms of how Sundays might look. Lots of other things going on, as I said, in midweek. Uh, Monday, the 7th of June, we're launching a new thing called the Forget Me Not Cafe. So we are. Uh, it's in the atrium area of the new building. Uh, many of us have experienced uh, loss, bereavement, uh, great sadness in the pandemic. And we're opening up that space for people to come who just like some time to be with others, to talk and pray perhaps, and to be safely together for an hour. And it's um, an hour between 11 and 12 noon on the 7th of June. Opportunity to talk and to listen and to be with others safely. Uh, if you need more information on that, get in touch with our marvellous pastoral team and our sort of marvellous clergy, but the pastoral team are particularly marvellous, can I just say that? So just get in touch with us and just um, ask for a bit more, but it's an opportunity for us really to be together. Pentecost is a time of beginnings, and we see all sorts of things happen as a result of um, the Holy Spirit coming in power in that uh, first um, engagement with the church, where the church starts and, uh, in Acts 2. Um, Rachel Schwann is good at beginnings. She's good at emails and systems and songs and letters, and she's good at beginning jobs of all sorts, but she's about to go and begin a new job. And again, your whoops are a bit weak, guys. <laughs> They're whooping at home, I think. I think it's a whoop, anyway. Um, uh, and so we um, have been having a, a week of just saying um, farewell, but, but don't forget us, really. Um, as we do these things, um, you'll know that behind the curtain is often something. Uh, Rhonda, have you got um, the capacity to go up and safely come towards us with something for Rachel? Um, I've got some, um, some fan mail. Um, I, think it's, I think it's been anti-backed. But, you know, I could put it just there. Can I just put it there? Okay. Um, you can pick that up. You can do the risk assessment on that. Rachel, this is um, from us. fantastic bidding, beginnings and medals and usually endings, but this week has been a little bit intense, hasn't it? So would you like to say something to us? I'd love to. Go on then. I don't know how I'll go today, but I just, I just, I just um, um, want to say thank you to you. Oh, it's been a big part of my life for a really long, long time. time. Um, um, we arrived when I was 12, 12 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, um, and, and so for more than half my life, life um, I've been involved, involved with, some with some areas in some way, some way um, um, and it's just been an incredible blessing and a huge encouragement, and I've been able to do so much and be around such wonderful, wonderful people, people. Um, um, because, because the church is the people that make it up, up. Um, and I'm and so, so, so grateful, grateful for all of you for all that you've done, done for me. For me. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. much. Well, so, um, sorry, I just had to think of the live chat, I was just ready to step in then when it began to come over you. Um, Bishop Mark is um, a very fortunate man, isn't he? And um, we really believe he's been appointed and anointed. And part of that confirmation, I think, is having Rachel Schwann as part of his team. And uh, we send her here from a wonderful church, St. Mary's. St. Mary's is a wonderful sending church. To go and do good for the kingdom and to go and sow into that which Bishop Mark is about. Jill Brown's going to uh, pray for you in a bit, I think, along with other things. But let me uh, just pray for you the words of um, some of the things from Philippians, really, that we've been praying as a staff team uh, this week. Grace and peace to you, Rachel, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Spirit. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And we pray that being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of his Spirit to empower you in all that he has for you to do. Amen. Jill, would you come and lead us in prayer? Beginning our prayers this morning with a reading from Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Lord, we come to you on this day of Pentecost to thank you for the creation of your church on that glorious day. Thank you for the continuation of your church through the centuries, despite the failings of Christians to honour and glorify you as they should. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your creation, for the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. Forgive us, Lord, for abusing and destroying what you have made. We pray for the leaders of nations to seek agreement in caring better for the environment. We pray, Lord, for all those places suffering from war, terrorism, persecution, and abuse in many forms. Lord, in your mercy, deliver them from violence and restore your peace and justice in these places. We especially lay before you Israel, Palestine, India, the Middle East, and Yemen. And this morning we pray for the Democratic Republic of Congo, where an enormous eruption of a volcano has occurred in a place called Goma, which is close to the Rwandan border. We pray for those people fleeing from this terrible disaster, seeking safety, unable to cross into Rwanda, because Rwanda has closed its borders. So, Father, we pray that all these people affected by the volcano will be brought to a safe place. And, Lord, may all who suffer in all of these places know your saving power and healing grace. Lord, in your mercy, We give you thanks for all those who have answered the call to serve you in faraway places. This week in Pentecost, we pray for all our mission links and partners and their families and communities throughout the world. We pray for Frank and Laura Greaves with Tear Fund worldwide. We pray for True Freedom Trust here in the UK, for Peter Harris, Hannah Pearson, Marcel and Paula Valgueras, Jasper and Taylor Gerhardt, all of our Russia, in Portugal, the UK, and worldwide. We pray for Alex and Susie McLean in Senegal, for Karen and Stush Niongose in Gambia, the Belly Bible Translation in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for Ipask also in Congo, for Richard Harrison in Zimbabwe, and for Rosemary Finlayson in Spain. Lord, we ask for your continued blessings to be on all these servants and pray for their continued good health, safety, and protection. Lord, we pray for the Queen and your church worldwide and locally. Be with all our leaders and grant them wisdom and discernment 
to be honourable people, putting your will before all else. We pray for Archbishop Justin Welby and for our own Bishop Mark. Continue to bless them, your faithful servants. We pray for our Church of St Mary's, for our leaders and all who serve to keep the Church alive and active. As we come out of lockdown, we pray for Nikki and Alec and all our lay preachers as they continue to bring us your word and teaching week by week in a safe environment. Give them your strength, your wisdom, your inspiration through your Holy Spirit. And give us, the people of your church, the grace to love, trust and appreciate them and all who serve you in this place to lead us forward in our service to you in this church and the wider community. And today we especially give you thanks for Rachel. You have blessed her with many gifts which she has freely used in service to this church. Now you have called her to serve you in Chester with Bishop Mark. Lord, go before her, walk beside her, and surround her with your love as she seeks to be your servant in a new place. And we pray for all those who are known to us who are sick or suffering at this time. Also for the lonely, the mentally ill, the unemployed, those struggling to feed their families, and all who have a special need of your comfort and love at this time. We remember James Wilson, Helen, Errol Henderson, baby Esther Pearson, Sue Jones, and Hazel Calvert. And continue to remember Anna Drysdale, Nathan Jerry, Peter Harris, Peter Southard, baby Evan, Doreen Patrick, and Maureen Longshaw. Lord, be their comfort and bring healing to body, mind, and spirit. We also remember the family and friends of Jack Jones, Joanna Nicholson, Deborah Williams, and Ernest Jeff. Lord, comfort and heal those who are grieving, and give them hope in the risen Jesus. Lord, accept these prayers in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, who is alive and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. And we will bring our prayers to a close, saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. to be doing something in the service today, but I want to encourage a second Jill, Jill Squared now, uh, to come up. Um, I'm going to step back so that you can speak from there. Today's reading is from Romans, Romans chapter 12, beginning at the first verse. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. 
For just as each of us has one body, with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another, another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So someone who's not called Jill, uh, that's Ken London, is going to come up and speak. Ken, do you want to come here? And then um, I'm just going to ask um, Ken some things before he speaks to us. Um, it's Pentecost Sunday, it's time for us thinking um, about gifts and time and service. Uh, last week, uh, if you remember, we had uh, Moira Nelson, uh, who came and spoke about there, uh, talking about the joy that comes in giving money. So I wanted to ask Ken before he preaches if he knew anything about the joy that comes from service and spending you know, your time and bringing your gifts and your talents into God's church uh, for his kingdom. So do you want to say a few words about that before you get cracking on the, uh, the preach? Yeah, I will. <laughs> um, there is a huge joy in serving. And for me, it starts when you've come to do a particular task, as in today, for example, when we stood in the vestry and we prayed about today, there is a huge thrill and a joy in bringing that to God, saying, God, we're going to serve you today, we're going to worship you today. Fill our hearts with that joy, fill our hearts with that message, and be with us and fill us as we go and serve. And then as we serve, as we do the act itself, whatever it is, and then just a couple of things that I know I've been involved in here was going round at Christmas. Don't ask me which Christmas. I've only been here for two Christmases, but I don't remember which one it was. <laughs> um, uh, to go round the Overchurch estate, just taking a small gift bag, a gift of hope, a message of hope, and a couple of little things. And at Easter this year, going out and giving those bags, knocking on doors, and uh, mostly people welcomed 
welcomed us, that we were there. Uh, well, one or two were just taken by complete surprise. Uh, I probably didn't know what to say and were very apprehensive. But there's a thrill in giving out the word of God to people. And there's a, a complete joy. You come back from that and you think, thank you, God. That was amazing. Now, I've seen you uh, take on new things during the pandemic. So you're sometimes at the back and you do stuff around cameras and easy worship and all that sort of stuff. How would you encourage us to come back and learn a new thing maybe and just to bring maybe an hour or two in the week? Has that been a good thing? How would you encourage us to do that? Uh, I think listen to the words that have just been read to us is the first thing. Uh, and we'll come on to that in a minute. But I'm a firm believer that every one of us has talents in some way or other. And God wants to use us. He's gifted us even before we were children of God. He's gifted us with some of these talents. And he wants to, us to use them to bring glory to his name. In some ways, he even trains us before we become Christians for what he's going to lead us into. And for me, part of that work was just certain things on computers. And it, it sort of takes things away. For example, what is used at the back on these words and things that come up on the screen are something called easy worship. Well, I had no idea that this church used easy worship. But in my previous church, when we set up the AV system, I was part one of the group that put that together. And I installed easy worship on the computer. We never used it because it was quite complicated and most of the others, most of the others couldn't use it. And I, so I didn't actually use it myself. But God prepared me for coming here to operate that system. I'm still struggling with it. <laughs> and by Rachel's last behind me, so does everybody else. But it's those things of using our skills. God wants us to use them for his glory. And now you're going to use some of your other skills and we're going to ask God to give the increase. Lord, we thank you uh, this Sunday. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you've come to us to inspire us and provoke us and prod us and challenge us and fill us. And we pray that you'll take Ken's words and all the preparation that you've been doing with him through this week and even before. And you'll take what he has and you will give the increase. Lord, may your word not go out void but return a hundredfold. To hear this morning and help us to serve you in power and grace and love. Amen. Amen. Get well, brother. Thank you. Good morning. I can say it now officially, it's all right. Good morning. Uh, let's just refresh where we're up to with this series that we're doing on, on being a healthy church. He is risen. Grace 
and wisdom and strength to act on those words that the Holy Spirit is going to put before us today. This Bible passage today is the only one in Romans that we're looking at in this series on being a healthy church. And I feel it's necessary then to put into perspective just a little bit about what it's because we're joining this book of Romans more than halfway through. So it's appropriate to just reflect and look a little bit at, at what goes before these words. Neither Paul or any of the other apostles had been to this church. It's thought that the church started by people returning from Pentecost, back probably Jews, going back to Rome, and then meeting each other as you sort of do in the synagogue and realizing actually something's changed in our life. And it's something about Jesus, and they start meeting together, start talking and sharing together. And they knew that their lives had changed from what they'd seen. And Paul writes this epistle, this letter, to help them to be rooted and established in love, that they may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul writes those words to another church. But he continues and explains the nature of humanity and the society that they're in. And incidentally, doesn't it look very similar to our society today? He writes in chapter 1, It's become filled with every kind of evil, greed, envy, murder, and so much more. He explains that these things which he defines as sin separate us from God. And in chapter 3, he writes this, Everyone has turned away from God. They've all done wrong. Not one of them does what is good. No, not even one. But then he starts to bring the good news. Yes, all have sinned, but all can become right with God by putting our trust, our faith in Jesus Christ. God will accept us if we come through faith in Christ. And the good news of the Christian message is that there is this way back. There is not at just the right time in history. Jesus came. And Paul writes, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even though we didn't know it, even though we didn't particularly know that we're not right with God, Christ died for us. He says a lot more. It's, it's a bit like, he sort of explains it in legal terms, suggesting it, it's like a law court, uh, and each one of us in turn stands in the dock, every one of us, and the evidence is brought before us, and is so damning about the lives that we lead, the fact that we ignore God, that there is no question of guilt, and the judge pronounces the the sentence for each one of us. And just as it's about to happen, Christ comes in and takes that punishment for us. That's what he did on the cross. That's the love that he has for each one of us, that he took our place. And now, in legal terms, Paul uses the phrase justification. All it means is now that we're right with God because the price for our sin, for my sin, has been paid. He says a, a lot more, some great God promises follow until the culmination of this section at the end of chapter 11. And this is what it says, and it's something we can rejoice in today. Oh, what a wonderful God we have. How great are his wisdom and knowledge and riches. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his methods. For who among us can know the mind of the Lord? Who knows enough to be his counsellor and guide? And who could ever offer them to the Lord enough to induce him to act? For everything comes from God alone. Everything lives by his power and everything is for his glory. To him be glory forevermore. 
I know I take a little bit of time explaining that, but I think it's important we understand our position before God and our position through Jesus Christ. So many people have been changed by that trust, that faith in him. In chapter 10 and verse 9, Paul wrote these words. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Wow, I've done that. I have confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I've believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And I am saved from an eternity without God to an eternity with God. And so are all who believe. But hang on, because Paul now writes this. One of his great therefores, do a bit of research, do a bit of studying on the therefores and buts in Paul's epistles, because this is one of the great therefores. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing will. Thank you, God, for saving me. I'll do anything for you. Well, God says, I want your life. I want you to offer your body as a living sacrifice to me. I want your life back, says God. I've taken the shackles off. The sun has set you free, and you are free indeed. But I want you with me going out into this world, and I want you to serve me to let people know of my love for humanity. It's not about you anymore. It's about you and me. We are going to go and work in this world. I want you to shine like a star in this perverse generation. I want you to have a new mind felt, mindset. It's not about you being selfish anymore. It's about us and others like us transforming this world through the power of the Holy Spirit and the message of love and reconciliation from the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm building you into family, and I want you to serve them. This is his message to each one of us now, today, right now, whatever time it is. I want you to serve them. I want you to teach, to preach, to prophesy, to give, to encourage, to lead, and there's so many more things that we can add to that list too. I want you to do that to the best of your ability to serve me. But hang on, Ken. Hang on, Nikki. Hang on, all of you. It's not just you. It's you and me through the power of the Holy Spirit. We rejoice today because today is the day that we remember God changed everything by giving the Holy Spirit into each person who believes individually. I find it absolutely amazing that God is in me through the Holy Spirit. I am supernatural. I haven't got a cape. I don't wear any underpants outside my trousers. But I am supernatural because that is what God has given to me, as he has to all who believe. I'm going to equip you for works of service so that the whole body of Christ will benefit by what you will do, by what I will do. Nikki, every one of us who serves him, by what we all do, in whatever way it is in which we serve. Remember what God did in the Old Testament to the children of Israel. In Exodus 13, we read this. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. At Pentecost,
past, God did that in a new way. No more pillar of cloud, no more column of fire, the Holy Spirit inside each one of us, guiding us and leading us, enabling us so powerfully on that first Pentecost today and still today too. I'm convinced that through Scripture, God equips us with what we need for doing His bidding. I'm using the skills that we've got, whatever they may be, that God will show within us to serve Him. And it doesn't matter whether it's uh, being able to preach, whether it's the ability to play music, the ability to sing, the ability to lead that worship, whatever it is, the ability to make a really good cup of coffee. It doesn't matter. If we do it as a service to the Lord, God will bless us and we will bring honour to his church and to the Lord Jesus. I think there are three ways in which God points us to service for him. Opportunity, scripture and prayer. At 15, it might seem it now, but at 15 years of age, I was a shy lad. I wouldn't say boo to a goose. I, I, I wasn't a the get to the front kind sort of person. I was a hang at the back sort of guy. And then I became a Christian. I had that Damascus Road experience, and it immediately changed my outlook on life. I'm not saying, but it did change me as an individual, because now I was a new person in Christ. But it also, at 15, in my last year of secondary school, started me thinking, what, what then, God, do you want me to do? Because I don't know. I, for years, I wanted to join the army. The leaders in the church, when I started going, she turned and said, it's a bit delicate, isn't it? Is the army really the place for you? So I started praying and saying, what is the place for me, God? And the army wasn't the place for me. He knew I wouldn't survive in the army. I couldn't be away from home that long. But then I started praying about it. And I left it with God in some ways. And in May of the following year, with a couple of months left to go to school, one of the guys in the class gave me this leaflet about being a fire cadet. And God took me from that to a two-year leadership course and then continued leadership training for the 30-odd years that I served in the fire brigade. And that leadership training God used to set me up for leadership within the church. Because that's the sort of God we've got. A forward planner. I'm hopeless at put things in my diary for the future. But that's the way God is with each one of us. So he gave me this leaflet. And I looked at this leaflet, and it was a Tuesday. I looked at this leaflet. This is really interesting. I thought, it's sort of similar to army, but I'm home every night. I, I can do this. So I went home, and on that Tuesday night, I prayed about it. Well, actually, before I prayed about it, I actually did my Bible reading for the night. Now, that Bible reading that night was something that ratified what God wanted me to do. You see, it was Revelation 20. Anyone's name who was not written in the Lamb's Book of Life was thrown into the lake of fire. And I thought, is this a little bit of a hint here about joining the fire brigade? And what, I'm a firm believer in it. If you want to know what you do, you don't just flick your Bible up and go, go and give all you've got to the poor. Uh, best out of three, Lord? No, I'm not a believer in that. It was the Bible reading I should have had for that day. And God spoke through Scripture. So I thought, I'll just pray about this as I finish and before I go to sleep. And I prayed to God and said, Lord, just show me that this is what you want, and I want to. And a fire engine went along the bottom road where I lived. 
liquid in, in some errands going. And I took the hint. So I filled the application in on the Wednesday morning, dropped it off at the headquarters in Liverpool City Centre on Wednesday evening on the way home from school. On the Friday, I got a letter to go for, an in, uh, for the entrance exam on the Saturday. So within five days, God had moved me. And when I went for the intern, for the uh, exam, of course, I, I'd say, of course, that was a bit bigger, big headed really, wasn't it? But I passed. And it's not surprising. And that led me into serving God in that way. And as I look back on that now, I can see the steps on that route that God led me into. And it's the same for all of us. When we open our lives up to God, there's this thing about him going before us, going in his footsteps. And if we go in his footsteps, that means he's gone before us. He's prepared the way for us. And we will be fruitful in what we do. And it wasn't just that job, because when I retired, the same thing happened with the next job, and we haven't got time to go into that. And the same thing happened too, when God, in, in his infinite wisdom, moved us from the church that my wife and I, Marge, had served at for 39 years, where I was in leadership, uh, and moved us to an Anglican church. We wouldn't have ourselves have chosen to have done that. Who would? <laughs> so, sorry, no, that's a joke, that's a joke, sorry. But we did. Yes, it did come as a shock. It was a surprise. But we knew it was where God, ultimately, after the difficult first couple of months, we knew it was where God wanted. And at just the same time, moving from Eastern to here, why does God want us to come to a church that is so blessed? I don't know. Except I know that what he wants me to do, and what he wants Marge to do, is to serve this church, getting the message of love of God out into this community that we live in. And it might be that God says that to you too. That I want you to do this. Remember Isaiah from the Bible wrote that very long book in the Bible, in the Old Testament. He had a vision of a mighty, holy, righteous God. And as he stood before him, he just said, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy. But in his vision, God touched him and made him worthy. And when God sent them, sent the, the message that he had for him, whom shall I send? Who will go out for me? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. You see, he was willing to do it. Once he, he, he knew his place before God, and he heard that message from God, he said, here I am. Send me. It might be that God equips you to be a church leader. Maybe not here, it could be somewhere else. It may be that God equips you to be an accountant for Goldman Sachs. It may be that God equips you to be a waste disposal technician. A bin man to you and me. My dad was a bin man for many years. He wasn't a Christian. But he was a bin man for many years. And he served with great diligence. And for that, it was an example to me. Serve him with great diligence. He wasn't one of those who'd skive off to the pub. He did what he did with diligence. That's what God wants from each one of you. Whatever, whatever he leads you to do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Paul wrote to the Colossian church, to you and to me, he wrote it too. Here I am, send me. And if you go and serve God with those words in your heart, he will honour and he will bless you for that service, whatever talent it is you're using. But two quick buts. I have never believed in the saying that's often quoted. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. It is for me a cop-out and a total denial of what the church is told to do. In Romans 10 we read, For 
for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? I have absolutely no doubt that the commission to make disciples, to make followers of the Lord Jesus, to baptize, to preach and to teach the good news, should still be the prime mover for any church today. That wherever we go to our families, our neighbours, our work colleagues, in our church youth work, in our church elder work, in our ladies groups, our men's groups, I think you get the drift. We must, with sensitivity and prudence, always talk about the Lord Jesus. Always. The people have got to hear the good news, because who will tell them if the church doesn't tell them? We've got to do it. We are the feet, the bringers of good news in this day and age. It's no good just being good people and open our hearts. We have to talk about who the Lord Jesus is. It's no good just giving our young people a good time. It's no good just playing bingo with our older people because they need to get out the house and meet with somebody else. It's no good doing all these things. We have to, at all times and all opportunities, let people know of the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord as we serve Him in whatever way it is that we're serving Him. You know, I, I sometimes get this picture of heaven this scene of people pleading with God and say, I didn't know about Jesus because they didn't tell me. They didn't tell me in the youth group. They didn't tell me in the ladies group. They didn't tell me after we played bingo. They don't tell me. And even worse, I went to church every month and I never heard about Jesus. That's an awful condemnation for anybody who pleads before God when we fail. I'm not saying we are failing. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying we shouldn't fail. We are the church of God and we should never hide the name of Jesus for any other reason. How can they hear without someone telling them? And the second but, there's no retirement. <laughs> there is no retirement in serving God. It might be there are role changes, but there is no retirement from the work of God. God will give you the strength to complete the task that he wants you to do, whatever that task might be. And when you've finished that task, God will say those words to you. The Apostle Paul wrote them. He was talking about himself, but it's the same for us. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I remained faithful, and now the proud crown awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly live, look forward to his appearance. Amen. So, you want to know how to serve God? Look for the opportunities. And don't forget that some of these ideas on serving him might come from people who aren't Christians, might come from other people. Read the Bible to get deeper with God, to cement your faith, to lay down those anchors for when the storms come. And if nothing else, it will help to clear the pollution that so eagerly entangles our minds in this corrupt generation. And finally, pray. Talk with God. Lay it on the line with him, that yes, I want to serve you, Lord. And where do we start? We start on our knees. A, a, a great um, missionary of the 19th century, Hudson Taylor, he started the China in Inland Mission. Loads of schools in China, loads of missionaries going out with the association. Thousands converted to Christ by the work that they were doing. And he wrote this one phrase in a book. We go forward on our knees. We're moving.
moving into as we leave this period of containment into a period of openness. We need to pray that as we go out from this lockdown phase into the new era of openness, that we do what God wants us to do. So let's remember that. Let's get on our knees and pray. And we're going to do that just now. So let's just pray. Father God, your word says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Your Holy Spirit has spoken to us today. I pray you'll continue to speak to us, to challenge us again and again. As we leave and go home and ponder your words, speak to us, I pray, and help us to serve you. Help us all. Help me never to miss an opportunity to talk of our Saviour and to bring the good news that he, he brought. We pray especially for Nicky and Alec, your chosen leaders here in this parish. parish. Give them an abundance of wisdom. Give them tons of grace as they serve you in leadership. And just now, Father, we pray too for Rachel. Just now that she will continue to use those skills and abilities that you've given her, they brought your glory to your name here in this parish. Let that continue in her new role as she carries on shining in this generation for the Saviour she loves. We ask all these prayers in the name of our Saviour who loved us and gave himself for us, Jesus Christ. And let me just finish with this benediction. I love it. It's one of my favourite ones. It's the end of Hebrews. And Rachel, this is for you as much as for all of us. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. May you work in us what's pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So let's stand and sing our final hymn and sing it prayerfully. And with passion for God, be thou my vision, my Lord and my heart.
welcome back. Thank you, children, for joining us. Thank you for those who've been um, helping out there. Um, there is a response form, as I said, uh, on the seats for people who are in uh, person here. Uh, there's a response uh, space on the website where you might go and just say, I want to know more about serving. I want to know more about giving. Uh, my uh, time, that isn't my time, it's the Lord's time. I want to give back to him that which he's given to me. And uh, you might want more details on that. Can I encourage you to fill that in? Do something, make an action. Um, we've got uh, an offer, offer tree plate, uh, which is big enough for you to imagine yourself stepping into. The Lord wants all of you. And so um, that'll be around the back here. Um, and if you want to uh, contribute uh, to our gift day, again, there's um, a way of doing that through the, um, the uh, sheets and uh, being able to do that today or through the website. There are some serving opportunities on the back of that sheet. One of them, I'm afraid, Ken, is not PR for the Church of England. So, sadly, brother, you're going to have to sign up for something else. Um, but, you know, we could create that. Uh, Rachel's going off. I'm sure she could use your talents. You know, Anglicanism, what's that? Uh, so, um, there are some other things you might get involved in. Um, all sorts of things have been happening uh, through the time of pandemic and before around serving, uh, serving God, serving one another as we proclaim his kingdom and his good news. Uh, so if you're here, sit where you are if you would like a cup of coffee. If you're going to rush off, then uh, go through the door, and I'll try and see you on the door as you go through that way. People will bring coffee to you, so we're not encouraging each other to mingle, uh, but to encourage people just to stay a little bit longer and just to have um, a cup of tea or coffee while you're here. So if you want tea or coffee, stay where you are. Let me pray for us as we go into this week. Lord, this week, come to our places. May we take you with us wherever we go, and may we find you in those places where we want to speak and be your good news. Give us courage and faith and endurance to make a difference wherever we are, speaking your name, acting in your truth and grace to be your disciples. And the Lord bless us and watch over us, make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look kindly on us and give us peace. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. The words of grace will appear, and uh, let's say the grace to each other, and as we, we do, is to bless our communities uh, wherever we are as we speak out through our windows as well as to one another inside the buildings. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, 